Good morning. morning. My name is Tom. It was something I said. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, And I'm normally on the Boulder campus, but happy to be here. I love what God's doing here in Thornton and that you're a part of it. Um, I'm especially grateful for Zach and Emily and uh, your leadership here and what's happened in the last year and a half that you've been here. We're really grateful for your leadership and preaching. Um, I get to be here today with you, which you'll determine whether that's good or bad news soon. Um, Today, uh, because of what's happening tomorrow, the children's ministry is closed, kind of a rest for our workers, and so with lots of kids in the room, which I'm glad for. If you're a kid, would you just wave to me? Hi, I'm so glad you're here. So normally, kids, most kids probably aren't in here, but I'm glad you're here. And if you want to ask a question, you can do that. I I hope that you'll pay attention to what I'm going to say. I usually talk to adults, but I'm glad that the kids are here in the room today. We're talking about people in the Bible who are heroes to us, people who lived a certain way and their faith reflects something that we can emulate, we can uh, practice ourselves. And The title is Unsung Heroes, and John the Baptist might be hard to fit the category of an unsung because he's pretty well known, but I'm old, and I'm the senior pastor, and I got to pick what I... I have wanted to preach on John the Baptist for a long time, and so um, this is a message that I, I just believe could send you out with a real new vision for your life. How many of you believe that what Jesus said is true? Okay, you you really do believe the words of Jesus? All of them? Good. What's your name? Reed. Okay. If you believe the words of Jesus, there is an astounding statement that if you are a follower of Jesus and a Christian today, you're in the Bible. It's, it's you that Jesus speaks about in relation to John the Baptist. It's the key verse in the text that we're going to look at, but it speaks about you if you are a follower of Jesus. And it's extraordinary Here's what it is. It's verse 11 of Matthew 11. If you have your Bible, you could open with me. I'm going to be in those verses, um, Matthew 11, 2 through 11. But this is the text that if you love Jesus, you're in this text. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is making a comparison here that a study of the text, I think, will help us understand what it means. But I believe that statement that the least in the kingdom, who would be a reference to those who followed after John the Baptist in the kingdom, are greater than John the Baptist. So... I'm going to step out on a limb and say you're greater than John the Baptist in some point of comparison that Jesus is making in this text. And that's what I want you to get today before you leave. What is that point of comparison? But to help us get it, we should run through the text. And so let's begin together. And we begin, I want to share two things. John's disorienting doubt and the extraordinary commendation that Jesus gives to him. So we start with his doubt, and that is verse 2. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of, what's the next word? The. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, not Jesus, but the Christ, the Bible's telling us that John is in prison And he's hearing about the deeds of the Christ, 
the Messiah, the promised one, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? There's several things we should pick out about this section is that John is obviously in prison. He's been taken into prison, which is more fully told in Matthew chapter 14. And from prison, John is having second thoughts about Jesus. He sends word to having heard about the Christ, the promised Messiah. John had in his mind that he was going to be the one who would announce to the world he was the forerunner, he was going to prepare the way for Jesus, and now he's in prison, and he's hearing about all these deeds that the Messiah did, and yet he's asking a question, obviously, I think, because he's in prison, are you the one, or should we look for another? I don't know if you've ever had doubts in your mind. Anybody ever have doubts? I have a picture of John who is a hero of the faith, who is in prison, and he's disappointed with how things have turned out. Have you ever been disappointed with God? We don't like to say it, but I love that the Bible simply puts a man of great faith here in front of us who in a very difficult place is having second thoughts about who is this Jesus? Now, John had been called by God um, at an early age in his mother's womb that he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and he was going to live in the wilderness and he was going to live a very austere life, you know, without anything and he's going to wear a leather, you know, garment and eat locusts and he's going to be trained in the wilderness in a really hearty way and then he's going to come on the scene and announce that Jesus is here. In fact, in, um, let's see, Luke chapter 3, I'll put it on the screen, verse 16 and 17, all the things John had been doing before he went to prison, this is what it it says of him. John answered them all saying, "Um, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I'm not even worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire and his Ooh, watch this. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat to his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This was the content of the message of John the Baptist before he was put in prison. And now he's sending word to Jesus. Are you the one that I was talking about? And Jesus is referred to here in John's, John the Baptist's words. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I baptize you with water. He's greater than I am. I'm not worthy to touch his sandals. He's got a winnowing fork in his hand. And the winnowing fork is this implement of the harvest that when the grain was brought in, the winnowing fork would take the wheat as it came to the threshing floor and the big fork would take the grain and just lift it up in the air and the winnowing fork would just keep lifting it up in the air and then it would drop back down. And if it was hardy grains of wheat, it would fall to the threshing floor. But if hopefully there was a little bit of wind, the wind would blow the chaff, which are the little particles of the grain that aren't worth anything. And pretty soon you'd have two piles. You'd have a pile of the grain. And then over here, you'd have a pile of the chaff that the wind would blow into this pile. And you would separate the good grain and the worthless chaff. And John's imagery is that when he comes, he's going to have a winnowing fork in his hand and he's going to create this harvest and he's going to separate the good grain from the worthless chaff and the chaff is going to be, everybody, burned. And I think John's in prison saying, where's the fire? as he anticipated that the Messiah, the Christ, would come, and he was going to do this. And one thing I would say about John in prison, that people are often disappointed with God because they don't have a full understanding of what the Bible teaches. And the fuller your understanding of what the Bible teaches, the more secure you will be in our hearts. In fact, the disciples frequently didn't know all the things that Jesus was saying. Some of you remember this text where Jesus said, who do people say that I am? 
And the disciples said, well, some say you're, um, you know, you're one of the prophets, you're Elijah, you're, you're this or that. Who do you say I am? What do you say? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, well done, that the, God revealed that to you. And the next section in that Matthew 16 passage, Jesus begins to tell his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be mistreated, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be buried, on the third day I'll rise again. And Peter, the very one who said, you're the Christ, says in that moment, no way, Lord, that's never going to happen to you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Peter in that moment didn't have a right understanding. He didn't have the full picture. And I think that's part of the theme in John the Baptist when he's asking, Lord, um, are you the one or should we keep looking for another? Well, Jesus answers, verse 4 in Matthew 11. Jesus answered them, all right, you disciples who come, report back to John. Go tell John what you see and hear. And then he begins to announce the manifestations of the kingdom of God on earth. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. Can we read the last phrase out loud together? And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus replies, I want you to tell John that all these manifestations of the Messiah who was to come, are really happening. The blind see, the deaf hear, lepers are cleansed, um, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. You tell John that the kingdom actually is here, and blessed is the one who's not offended by me. And he's talking to John because John's in prison, and he's sort of offended that the winnowing fork hasn't arrived yet. All these good things, John knew about all the good things that Jesus was doing, but there was something missing. Now, if you were to look at where these um, manifestations of the coming kingdom, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, those come from Isaiah. And in Isaiah, one of the sections is chapter 35 and the other is chapter 61, you will find those manifestations, those marks of the coming Messiah blind seeing. Beautiful. And in each section, Isaiah 35 and 61, there is also another phrase there that Jesus doesn't cite. In chapter 35, right next to the eyes of the blind shall see, there is this line that Jesus doesn't say. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, and he will come and save you, the blind will see. And in Isaiah 61, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's there in Isaiah 61. So John says, are you the one? Jesus says, go tell him these things. And in John's mind, when he heard them, he would have said, oh, that's Isaiah 35. Oh, that's Isaiah 61. The blind see, the deaf hear. But you didn't say anything about the vengeance. Now, John knows that Jesus doesn't say that. And Jesus knows that John knows that Jesus doesn't say it. <laughs> and Jesus says, don't be offended. The kingdom is here, but it's not fully here yet. It's not the full picture yet, John. And John is in prison wondering whether God keeps his word. Is he really the Messiah? And Jesus says, you don't see the big picture yet. Here's what I'm quoting to you. These good, beautiful parts of the kingdom and the judgment coming is not yet. I think what Jesus is telling John is something that we all have to understand, that the kingdom has been inaugurated, it's been started, but it's not fully here. 
Don't you feel like you're not yet in the kingdom of God? But you know the king and you love the king, but things aren't right yet, are they? They're not right in the world. And Jesus, don't be offended yet. If I could talk to everybody here, especially those who are under the age of 25, this is what I would say to you. Try not to ever be offended at God because you might not know the full picture yet. Jesus said, go tell John these things are happening. You will be happy if you're not offended with me now. You don't see the whole picture. How many of you have experienced, I don't see the whole picture? Yeah, all of us. We all have that. And Jesus is saying, hang in there, John. And I would say to you, the world is not right. It's hard, but hang in there. The king has come. He's brought the kingdom, but it's not fully here yet. You, you, you agree with that? It's not fully here yet, and I think that's what he's telling him. It's like yeast that starts, and then it's going to grow. It's like a seed that's planted. It's here, but it's not fully here yet. Okay, so John has disorienting doubt. If you've doubted God, hang in there. Don't be offended by God. Um, let's see where the text takes us. What happens next is Jesus gives to John some extraordinary commendation. And I'll bet you what happened, that you go tell John so the disciples leave. And the Jesus' disciples who are remaining with him, I bet they started to talk together. Can you believe John the Baptist is doubting? You think they probably were chit-chatting together about the failures of another Christian leader? Maybe. And Jesus is going to interject at their chit-chat about another Christian leader failure and say, hold on a second. And he begins, as they went away, verse 7, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What's the implied answer there? No. What is a reed? A reed is a tiny little plant. A plant that is by the water that blows. It doesn't usually break by the wind, but it bends over and it can break. But it just moves wherever the wind. If the wind blows this way, it goes that way. If it blows this way, it goes that way. And Jesus is asking the question, is that what you went out to see? Like someone who gets influenced easily by what other people say? And the answer is, John the Baptist, that? No way. He was a straight shooter. He called people out. He didn't go this way if the crowd went that way. He was a rock-solid dude. And he stand, this stands for someone who, who doesn't bow to the pressure of other people. They went out to see him because he was no wimp. You know, among the things that he said, he, he, people came to him and they, you know, when the Pharisees and Sadducees came, he actually pointed his finger at them. I won't do it to you because it'd be rude. But I, I think he said, you brood of vipers, you den of snakes, you cunning, devising schemers. So is that a reed shaken by the wind? I mean, he stood strong and was a straight shooter. And he said, if you want to follow the Christ, then bring forth the fruits worthy of repentance. In fact, it was John, the reason he's in prison. Does everybody know why he was in prison? He was in prison because he spoke truth to power. He spoke to Herod and said to Herod, you should not have divorced your wife. You should not have seduced your brother's wife and married her. And that's what put him in prison. So is he a reed? Did you go out to see a reed? No. Jesus continues, did you go out? What did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Uh, you know, was he somebody who went this way, that way? No. Was he somebody who was fine in uh, silk suits and gold rings and TV hair and TV contracts? And was he that? You get where I'm going, right? It's like, was he, 
Was he somebody who was soft? No. He was, he was a rugged man of courage and faith. And he makes an analogy to the people in king's houses who had a very soft experience. And he said, no, that's not John. That's not who he, who he is. Now, just listen for a moment. Those two questions that Jesus asks are a lesson for us. He's pointing out that John is a man of courage who says what God wants to be said no matter what the world thinks. And the moment that the church begins to be a reed that moves this way and that way, the church loses its power. But when the church says what God wants to be said, that's where power is, whether people like it or not. You can say it nicely. You can say it graciously. I'm not talking about being unkind or with hubris or pride, but John was a person who spoke what God said. Whenever the church becomes an echo of the world and simply says what the world says, that we don't need the church anymore. John was neither of those things. Well, what was he? And this is the point where Jesus is building. The next verse, please. Verse 9. What did you go out to see then? A prophet? Yes. That's what you went to see. And more than a prophet. Why more than a prophet? Well, it's tied to this, verse 10. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So these verses together... Jesus is saying something about John, that he is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. He's more than a prophet because of this prophecy about him. Now that statement in verse 10 comes from Malachi 3.1, lifted right out. Also in Malachi, and in, um, let's see, there it is, verse 4 and 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord, that he may turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land. Now, let's take a minute. That's a safe step. Okay, good. Um, Here, we're in the book of Matthew, right? Let me put it on this side. If you go in the Old Testament, 400 years, you get Malachi. Malachi this verse that's on the screen. The last words of the Old Testament are, I'm going to send you Elijah, and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, children to their fathers. There are 400 years between Malachi and Matthew 11, roughly. Hundred years of silence. And then John comes on the scene. And Jesus says of him, Is he a prophet? Oh, yes. He's more than a prophet. He's the one of whom it is said, I'm going to send my messenger before your face, and he will prepare the way for you. What Jesus is saying is that John occupies a strategic place in the history of God's unfolding story of grace so that the very next verse, the key verse that in my mind, in verse 11, is that there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Of all the men born of women, no one is greater than John. Why? Because he's a prophet. He's more than a prophet. He's the one of whom it is said he's going to prepare the way for Jesus. Let me see if I can illustrate it. Think of a timeline here. Because if Jesus is truly saying, John the Baptist is greater than Abraham. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than King David, King Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And all the prophets. John the Baptist is greater than any other human being born. Why? 
because it is said of him, he's going to prepare the way, he's going to introduce Jesus to the world. It's John the Baptist who is in immediate proximity to Jesus Christ so that he could literally say across the river, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's him. He it is. It is him. He. Jesus. He's right there. I think what Jesus is saying is that John is in the place in the history of the unfolding of God's plan that he is immediately proximate to Jesus so that he could say, here he is. Any questions? So what's the point of comparison? Here we are on the other side. John's in prison. What's going to happen to him a month from this story is his head is going to be removed from his body and he's going to die in prison. And what will he not see? He will not see the death and the suffering and the burial and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And that is why the least in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John because you see the whole story. Is that not awesome? I, I think that's why Jesus is saying the least in the kingdom of heaven have the benefit of knowing what John did not know in that moment. So, Let's, let's bring it home. What Jesus is really saying is great. When you think about a great person, who comes to your mind? Well, what are the measures of greatness for us when we think about people? You think, oh, well, they're wealthy, so they're great. Or they have political power or influence or they're educated or they... Um, you know, they created something, or they're great because, fill in the blank, but our measures of greatness uh, fall short of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is making a measure of greatness here of people, John the Baptist being one of them, and then everyone else in the kingdom of God being even greater than him. So what is that measure of greatness? Well, I, I put three things down. Number one, what, what makes us great in God's eyes? And the first is really important for every young person. It's our identity. It's who we are in relationship to Jesus. In other words, if, if John was the greatest born of women, but the least in the kingdom are greater, it must be because we know something more about Jesus than even John knew. And, and our place here... Uh, we have sort of a Christ-centered criteria for what is great, and Jesus seems to be saying that it's great because of where we are in the history of, of this unfolding story. Being born on this side of the cross puts us in a very unique position that you know all that there is to know about Jesus, that he did die, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he's ascended into heaven. Do you know that to be true? John didn't. So you're in a better position. You are in a position of proximity to Jesus, closeness to Jesus, that you see the whole story. And one of the things that that should do for every young person is simply to say, I know the truth about Jesus. He, you know, we say it in our creed. We believe that Jesus died and was buried and that he rose again and that he descended into heaven and he now is at the right hand of God and that he's coming again. Do you believe that? John wasn't sure about that. He didn't have the whole picture. But we do because we know that. I would love for you to have that as part of your core identity. I know who Jesus is. I know what he accomplished. I know what he's done, and I believe it. And in the words of Jesus, you're great because of it. I might take another application. The second thing that makes us great in the eyes of God is our mission. 
our mission to make Jesus known to the world. John was great because he was the one who was immediately there who said, this is, this is the one. I think every one of us in the room have as our great commission go into all the world and make disciples, right? We, we make disciples. It's our mission. And part of the thing that God is looking for, what will make us great, is we actually introduce Jesus to the world and the world to Jesus. That's our call as a church, and that's what we want to do. I'm going to insert it here, but tomorrow, Kids Week starts. And Kid, Kids Week is going to be filled in this building with about 65 to 70 young kids. 80% of them are not a part of this church. Okay, what does that mean? That means we're going to have part in the mission tomorrow and all week of introducing kids to Jesus. And we're in a good position to do it because we're on this side of the cross and our mission is to make Jesus known in the world. And that's a measure of greatness that Jesus noted in the Bible. And I might say the last thing, what makes us great in the eyes of the Lord is that we know our playbook. We read the Bible. I've made the point that John didn't know all of the things. The, the disciples didn't always know the full story. But do you realize how privileged you are to hold this book in your hand that has all of the Old Testament prophecies that, sh that, that sort of mysteriously whispered there's a Messiah coming. They weren't explicit. Some of them you, you had to really search. But again and again, the Old Testament points to a coming Messiah. And then John is, it's all cool. <laughs> I have that effect. Um, and then John says, are you the Christ that they all spoke to? And we're on this side. We have the, the totally unfolded New Testament. You have all the truth. So what I would say to you is, what will make you great is your ability to know who Jesus is, introduce him to the world, and knowing your Bible is going to help you do that. Remember John was asking, are you the one? How come you didn't say this? It's coming. It's coming. We know it's coming. So I'll, I'll just conclude this. No sermon that's ever given here is going to change your life forever. It's going to influence it. But what will change your life is the steady diet of God's Word in you over time. You're nourishing yourselves in the truth of God, and what happens is you begin to see the bigger picture and when you get disappointed with God because you don't see it, it should drive us back to the Scriptures and say, what am I missing? What, what's happening here? How do I see the fuller picture? We see through a glass dimly. We, we don't know the whole thing yet. But what we know is more than the saints of old ever knew. So, you're greater. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for a glimpse into a, a hero, a man of courage and faith who followed you even through some of his doubts. And Lord, he, he was a martyr. We look at that and we hear your words to him. He was great in your eyes. And I pray that you will just simply help us to see your measure that we know the truth, we believe it fully. And I pray for anybody who's been disappointed with God or maybe in this moment is that you will just give us grace today to hang in there, to not be offended by Jesus, to believe and to hold some things loosely that we may not fully understand. But God, give us faith that we believe in you you are the Christ. You are the one we cling to, and the one we believe with all our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.